And one of the things that I wanted to contribute, and I'm, I'm glad to, um, to have the opportunity to talk to you about it, is some experiences that I've had with the parliamentary process. Um, and just kind of give you guys a quick boot camp, crash course, whatever you want to call it, before we do our mock convention here. Um, just to kind of get a, the sense of the room, uh, how much experience you may have, or, or how much interest you may have in Robert's Rules or Parliamentary <coughs> Procedure. Um, just sh by show of hands, how, how many of you here would consider yourselves uh, advanced, or, or that you've got a real good understanding of how to behave in a caucus or convention? Just a small handful, okay. And then novices, not really sure what to do. If you're, if you're in a caucus or convention, not really sure how to make a motion, okay. So some of you are kind of in the middle then, all right, interesting. Well, I, I, think, um, I think this is going to be targeted at the right audience then, because we're going to just cover the absolute basics. You know, pretty much, Heather? I'm sorry to interrupt, you can put the laptop on the podium if it's more comfortable. Oh yeah, for I wasn't sure if it was going to reach, thank you. All right, let's try again. So this is, um, this, this is the, the basics, right? We're going to start from, we're going to start from square one, just to make sure that everybody's uh, got a good foundation. So why does parliamentary process matter? Um, you know, you might think to yourself, this is just some bureaucratic mumbo jumbo, just some rules that we have to follow. But it, it's actually pretty important, and it's it's a fundamental of democracy. I, I can't, you know, emphasize that enough. Um, Robert's Rules of Order. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Before I get started, I, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Did everybody get a copy of a little card that I passed out um, with the, the cheat sheet? Does, every, does everybody have one, or does anybody need one? Anybody needs one, I'll just hand a few down the enemy row and let's make sure that everybody that wants one can get one. Yeah. But on the back side of this, you'll find a um, you'll find like a quick reference that kind of gives you hopefully an easy way. Thanks. That kind of gives you an easy way to figure out what it is that you want to do at any point throughout a caucus or convention or even just a business meeting. So it'll tell you if, if of course that meeting is following Robert's rules, it'll tell you what to say based on what you want to do. So hopefully that's helpful and you'll, you'll be able to follow along as we're going through this. So why, why is this important? Why does this stuff matter? Fundamentally, what this system of rules does is it allows a body of people to be able to make a decision. Which anybody that's tried to have a meeting or, or that's, that's you know, tried to participate in a large group of people that all have widely different opinions can attest that it's very, very difficult to reach a consensus within a group of people. And that's exactly what this does. It's the foundation of democracy. Because these rules, essentially, they, they ensure that the body uh, is going to get what it generally wants. And that's defined as the will of the majority. Okay, is the will of the majority perfect? No, of course not. But it's the best thing we've found so far. It also protects the rights of the minority within the body as well. So 51% of the people within the assembly can't just, just flat out overrule the other 49%. The minority always has a chance to speak, they always have, to ch have the chance to be heard, and they always have the chance to attempt to influence the decision of that group of people. Um, so, the, so built into that is protection of the minority to always have that option. And it provides order, fairness, and decorum. I mean, we couldn't possibly get anything done whether it's in a business setting or a political setting or, or any kind of decision-making process. If we can't treat each other with respect, if we can't allow each other to be heard, if we can't make our points known in a, in a respectful uh, uh, you know, sense of decorum. And ultimately, the whole purpose of this is just to get business done. You know, It facilitates the transaction of business, and that's, that's what Robert's Rules is essentially all about. Whether, again, that business is passing a law or you know, or just deciding what it is we want to eat for lunch. So, the basic principles of the parliamentary procedure are all members of the assembly have equal rights. So you can kind of see this is very, it's a very democratic system. Um, you have to have enough people present in order to be able to do business. If you've got a body of, let's say, 50 people in your county organization or whatever, five of them can't get together, have a meeting, and pass, you know, uh, pass resolutions. You've got to have at least enough people in your business. Every issue should be able to be discussed. So that's a fundamental principle. We don't just propose something and quickly vote on it. If someone wants to talk about that issue, debate it, have their pros and their cons articulated, they have that right to do that. But we have to regulate the discussion. We can't all talk at once, and we can only discuss one issue at a time. Otherwise, the whole system will break down because it would just be too confusing. 
So the way that we do that is we have the meeting organized with a chairman. The chairman is essentially supposed to be a neutral, unbiased, basically a mediator, kind of like a traffic cop. The chairman is the person that allows people to speak in order and allows the execution of these Roberts rules, this parliamentary procedure, to get business done. The chairman's purpose is to get a resolution to the issue at hand or the question at hand. So we're only allowed to speak when the chair actually recognizes us, with some certain caveats to that, which I'll get into later. Except in the matter of personal rights, which is to say, as I was saying, protecting the rights of the minority within the assembly, majority generally rules. Now, I mean, you can manipulate that based on your own bylaws, but generally the, the, the way it works is majority rules. But if we are going to override someone's personal rights, typically that requires more than a majority. In other words, a supermajority or some, some larger group of, of, the, of the body has to be in place in order to, to basically tell someone that they're no longer allowed to speak, for example. However, if you don't vote, your silence gives consent. So only the voting members um, uh, you know, have a voice toward deciding the issue. And the chair, as I've kind of already covered, is supposed to remain out of the issue. The chair is just a traffic cop, not a, really a, a, a participating member of the decision making. So let's cover some important terminology. I'd like to start, uh, we'll, we'll go through a little, we'll make this a little bit interactive here, we'll do we'll kind of a little bit of a quiz. Does anybody know how to define the term quorum? What does that mean? Yeah? It's a uh, collection of a group of individuals uh, with a similar goal or uh, purpose. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's closer. Right. Right, absolutely. I, th I, think that, I think that's the closest. So it is a collection of a group of individuals, but it's, it's very specifically the minimum number of that group that's required in order to do business. So usually, you know, the, the general rule of thumb on this is it's just a simple majority. So if you've got 50 members in your organization, you're going to need to have at least 50% plus one member. Uh, that would be 26 people have to be present in order for you even to begin to do business. If you've got 25 or 24, then the, the meeting has to dissolve because that would be a minority uh, imposing their will on the majority of the group. How about a motion? Does anybody know what a motion is? Point of order. That's, that's an example of a motion, absolutely. Point of order is an example of a motion. But what's the general term mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's basically, um, it's the function, I call it the functional unit of work for the meeting. But it's essentially, just like you said, it's a proposal to do something. Um, it's, it's the way that a delegate or a member of the assembly would introduce the topics or points or issues or questions that they want the body to discuss and ultimately resolve. And then what about a question? I kind of touched on it already. No? The question is, is essentially just that very question. It's that, it's that issue that the body is going to vote on. So the question ultimately is the thing that the body is voting yes or no to. Should we do this thing? Yes or no? That's the question. OK, so here's the basic outline of how we do a, a, an item of business in a, a meeting or an assembly. So first, someone has to make a motion. You can't be talking about something without someone having proposed a thing to talk about. Uh, generally, that's a motion to do something. Resolve that we would like to, you know, all go outside and get some fresh air. You know, whatever. Um, someone generally has to second the motion. That's not always the case. There are some types of special types of motions that don't require a second. But in almost every case, there is a second that's required. The second is essentially someone, just someone that backs you up. In other words, one single person in the assembly, it's to prevent one single person in the assembly from making senseless proposals all the time. You know, I want to do this, I want to do that. Now we have to debate it and vote on it. You need to have at least one other person that agrees that that's a point that we should even talk about. You know, I want to, I, I move that we go outside and get some fresh air. Well, we just sat down, so nobody's getting second back. You know, we're, we're trying to do business here. Okay? The chair generally then repeats the motion so that everybody can hear. If that's a debatable kind of motion, which most are, um, then the chair will recognize speakers that want to argue either for or against that particular proposition. Well, I think we should go out and get some fresh air because blah, 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 blah. Well, no, we shouldn't, and so forth. 
eventually someone asks to move the question, which essentially that means, let's take a vote on this. Uh, we're done talking, we've heard all the points, you know, pros and cons, we just want to take a vote. Then we can have a voice vote, a standing vote, a show of hands, it's really up to the group to decide how they want to take their vote. And then the motion either passes and therefore is enacted or it fails and nothing is done. Any questions so far? It's pretty straightforward when you lay it out like that, I think. So let's go over the most common types of motions so that you guys kind of know what options are available to you when you're, when you're in a meeting. The most basic kind of emotion is essentially just the main motion. And the main motion can really be anything at all. Um, it's just whatever it is that you want to ask the body to vote on, whether, whether or not we should use this thing. So, for example, I, I just made the example. I move that we adopt the following resolution, resolved that we should order pizza. And then that motion is uh, on the floor in, in the terminology, which essentially means it's before the body to discuss and decide. Now, the next uh, most common kind of motion is a motion to amend. So, once you've got a motion or a resolution that's in front of the body being discussed, that motion doesn't, it's not permanently static throughout the entire course of that conversation. Actually, at any time, someone can move to amend the motion. We probably offered uh, about, you know, amendments to legislation in Congress. You know, we're going to attach this additional language to it or whatever. Sometimes that causes problems, but Amendments are, are a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do. If someone has made a motion, but their wording or the exactly precise thing that they want to do isn't acceptable to the body, you could change it slightly so that it is. Now, this is called a subsidiary motion, and not instead of a main motion. The main motion is the thing we want to do. So now that we've got the thing we want to do that we're talking about on the floor, any motion that then applies to that thing that we're talking about is called a subsidiary motion because it's, it's, uh, it's secondary to the main motion. So, for example, um, if we're talking about whether or not we should uh, order a pizza, resolve that we should order a pizza, I might want to make it clear what kind of pizza we want to order. So I might say, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I move to amend the resolution, and I would move to add the words with pepperoni after the word pizza. Now, the point that we're debating or talking about is whether or not to add those words not necessarily about whether or not to order a pizza, okay? So then we're going to have to go through a whole decision-making process, and the question now becomes, should we add the words with pepperoni? That's the question we're not talking about. So, let's say we have some debate about whether or not we should add the words with pepperoni. Eventually, we're going to take a vote, and, and the body decides, yes, we, would all, we all think that's a better resolution. We would like the resolution to say, resolve that we order a pizza with pepperoni. The body votes. The motion passes. Now we go back to the main motion, but the resolution is different. And now the question we're talking about is, should we order a pizza specifically with pepperoni? Making sense to everybody? I know the whole, the whole deal with going into the nested motions and coming back out again is that's the part where people get tripped up. So I just want to make sure everybody follow. Okay. Now, we talked about this whole piece about the debate, right? We're talking about should we or should we not order a pizza, and there might be pros and cons and points on both sides. And then once people are talking about those pros and cons, that's called the debate, you know, pretty straightforward. Well, you can make a motion to either extend that debate if you think that this topic really deserves more discussion, or to limit the debate if really, you know, it seems like we've pretty much talked this thing to death. Why don't we go ahead and shorten the debate period and just get on with the voting. So this is another really, really common type of motion that will happen and that you may want to make happen if you're in a convention or a caucus. If you either feel like the issue's not getting sufficient attention, you may want to make a motion to the chair to extend that, that period of debate. Or, you know, again, a lot of times in order to speed the process along, if this is like, you know, hey, come on, do we really need to keep talking about this? You can move to shorten that period and just get it over a quicker. So, a lot of times there will be a limit on the number of speakers, and a lot of times there will be a limit on the amount of time that each speaker is allowed to talk. So you can make a change to either one of those. For example, let's say you really want to, you really think this is a really important issue about the pizza. You've really got to talk this thing, you know, out. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, 
I move to extend the debate to 10 speakers per each side and 10 minutes per speaker. So that could be, you know, a total of 200 minutes of talking. Keep that in mind. Okay, but if you really want to extend it, you could. Uh, and, um, and, and then again, now, this is a subsidiary motion. So now the question on the table is, should we extend debate? We're now going to be able to debate that point. <laughs> Take a vote, and then if the body decides they agree with your motion, then debate will be extended, and we'll go back to the main motion again. Now we're talking about pizza, but we're talking about it for a long time. Make sense? <laughs> Another common motion is the motion to postpone. Now, the motion to postpone essentially means that we're going to set aside this motion for a period of time, until later, or you could say indefinitely. That's a legitimate motion. I'd like to postpone this indefinitely. Generally, why would you ever postpone something indefinitely? Because you just want it to go away. This is, this is not something we want to be talking about. We don't even want to take a vote on it. We're not even going to vote yes or no on this. We're just going to set it aside and it might never come back. Or, alternately, this might just not be the appropriate time to talk about it. Okay, if it's 9.30 in the morning and somebody moves to order a pizza, you may say, you know, Madam Chairman, I move to postpone this until dinner time. Let's talk about some other things right now. So, keep this in mind. Motion to postpone, if you're trying to kill the resolution without voting on it, this is the way to do it. Okay? You would make a motion to postpone indefinitely if the body agrees, that thing goes away and never comes back. Now, the motion to the previous question. Okay, this is, this is a little tricky to follow, but it's actually a very, very simple concept. You want to take a vote right now. I am tired of talking about this. I don't want to limit the debate. I just don't want any more debate. No more debate. I want to take a vote. You say, Madam Chairman, I move the previous question. Okay? Now, we got into this in the last mock convention, so I probably ought to talk about all the previous questions as well, perhaps, but that might just overcomplicate things. Um, or previous questions, I should say. But at any rate, so the easy one is, I want to move the question, or I want to move the previous question. Okay, so now remember how you talked about how you've got your main motion, and then you can have your subsidiary motions. I should have made a pattern. You can have your subsidiary motions, okay? So whatever question it is that we're talking about at the time, let's say at this particular point in the, let's call it a conversation, what we're talking about is, um, for example, we'll go back and we'll say that someone is trying to postpone the motion. Let's say, if you want to take a vote on postponing the motion, you would call the previous question, which is to say the, the, the question that we are now currently talking about. All right? Now, you can also, you can also move all of the previous questions, which would take you all the way back to the main motion, from wherever it is that we are right now. You know what? I want to vote on whether or not we're going to have a pizza. I'm tired of all of this, you know, all of these shenanigans or whatever. You can move that. If somebody seconds it, the body's going to vote on it. Right then and there. Boom. But this is an example of, remember how I told you about depriving the minority of their rights? This is an example of that. Because you sitting in the minority might want to continue to talk about this topic. You might think this is a very important thing. However, somebody else might think, you know what, we're done talking about this. I just want to have a vote. In which case, they're taking away your right to debate. And that's why this requires a larger than a majority decision. <clears throat> a, lot of people, a lot of people refer to this as calling the question. Um, I think pretty much every chair in the world will understand what you mean. If you say that you want to call the question, um, technically it is the movie question. But either way, it means the same thing. Um, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, I move the question or I move the previous question. Um, in other words, I would like to vote on whether or not we're going to order a pizza right now. No more debate. But anyway, for the moment, we're going to talk about laying on the table. So a lot of people mistakenly think that this is what you would do to try and kill a motion without voting. Remember, what we talked about before is the real way to do that. Does anybody remember? Well, I know you do that. Postpone indefinitely. Postpone indefinitely. It's exactly right. Lay on the table is different. Now, it's important. I, I cover it because it's actually it has an appropriate use. 
It's just not the one people sometimes think it is. But lay on the table means essentially we need to put this aside for some other urgent business that has come up, urgent unrelated business. So we're not going to we're not going to vote on this right now. We're also not going to kill it indefinitely. We're just going to set it aside for a short moment while we talk about something else. So, for example, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I move to lay the resolution regarding pizza on the table because the house is on fire. Should we evacuate? I move to evacuate. You know that kind of thing. Okay. Um, now, so it's whatever, whatever kind of urgent business would interrupt the flow of whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. You can lay it on the table. Any questions about that? I know the motion postponed to lay on the table can kind of confuse you, but slightly. Okay. Now we should talk about things that can interrupt the process. Remember, we just got done talking about main motions and subsidiary motions, where if you want to make this kind of a motion, you must be recognized by the chair. Well, there are some other kind of motions that can actually, where you, as a member of the assembly, can interrupt the process right then and there. You don't need any permission to do so. You just stand up and you start yelling. <coughs> or you, in, in the case of the convention, you've got a special colored light being blue. And, um, you can interrupt the process because something's going wrong. Usually, there's something that's, that's going wrong and you need to call attention to it. Okay? <clears throat> Generally, these all start with point of something or other. So, for example, a point of order. A point of order is used to notify the chair and the assembly that someone has basically broken the rules. Okay? And the chair didn't catch it, but you did. So you'd say, Mr. Chairman, point of order. Okay, well, whatever's happening, that person speaking, you jumped up and said point of order, so now it's all on you. What's, what's the deal? Well, that speaker's time is clearly over. I've been watching the clock. They only had three minutes, and it's been four and a half, and the chair's not telling them to stop, but it's someone else's turn to speak. They broke the rules. You're calling attention to it. Now, the chair can rule you in, again, can rule you in or out of order on what you're saying. They can say, no, I'm watching my clock, and he's still got 30, 15 seconds left. What? Okay. But then we get to a point of appeal. So, again, you can jump up and interrupt the process for a point of appeal. And this is if you want to appeal a decision of the chair. This is what we were just talking about, where let's say the chairman has made a mistake, or the chair, or you don't agree with the chairman's decision, that the chairman's decision was valid, or was indeed in order. You can appeal it. And then the assembly can take a vote on whether you're right, or whether the chairman's right. And if the body upholds your position, guess what? You just overruled the chair. You can appeal the chair. So, uh, Madam Chairman, I appeal the Chair's decision. The previous speaker was not out of order. They still had 15 seconds left to speak. I want them to have their time. And so the Assembly will vote on your appeal. <coughs> if the Assembly's with you, that's what happens. Point of information is used when you need to ask something of the Chair <coughs> urgently for clarification so that you understand what's going on. It's the duty of the chair, and it's generally the duty of the assembly to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and is, and is you know, cognizant of all of, all of the um, you know, particulars of the point of discussion. So at any point, you can ask a question of the chair about what's going on. Well, well, I should say, you can ask the chair about the details of what's being discussed. Okay? So for example, um, you, you've lost track. We've had like four resolutions now. Two of them passed and two of them failed, and you can't remember what the wording is of even of the resolution that we're discussing. So you can say, Mr. Chairman, point of information, you're interrupting the current speaker if you have to. Mr. Chairman, point of information, can you, can you please read back to the assembly the current wording of the resolution after the amendments that have been accepted? And the chair has to read it to you, has to give you that information. And then we have division, or division of the group, division of the assembly, whatever you want to call it. The point is that you can force a standing or accounted vote if you feel like the chair's decision about whether the vote passed or failed was it incorrect. Okay. So a lot of times in a in a caucus or or in a convention, um, we'll just be taking voice votes for most things. Uh, you know, all the ayes, aye. All the nays, nay. And the chairman just simply decides who won and who lost, based on what it sounded like. Well, let me tell you, sometimes 
there's a small group of nays that somehow get really loud, okay? <laughs> or eyes, or whatever. All right. So if you don't like, if you, you know, if you're looking around and you know you saw how many people were yelling and you just didn't, it just doesn't feel right. Like you jump up and you say division. Okay. And basically what that means is that you demand that the chair take a counted vote of some kind, either by show of hands, by standing up and sitting down, or by actually doing a, a secret ballot. Okay. Now again, it's the chairman's prerogative to then decide how that counted vote will be taken, and if you don't like it, then you have to appeal, and so forth. Generally, with a fair chairman, they're trying to be fair. You know, they're, they're not trying to, you know, finagle a result out of, the, out of the assembly. So you generally don't have to worry about these things. But if it's happening, these are the, the tools at your disposal. These are, the, these are the weapons that you have to ensure fairness in the assembly, okay? So you just say division, or you could say division of the group, division of the assembly, whatever, which basically means, you don't have to say it, but it means I demand to be counted. So, in conclusion, um, oh, there's one other thing I do want to say. There's one other thing I want to say about point of information, real quick, before I move on. I didn't put this in the slides, but you will find it somewhere on your sheet, okay? There's another thing that's like point of information that you may want to that you may want to know, and that's point of inquiry. And these these are confusing because they sound very very similar, okay? But and you can pretty much use them interchangeably, and the chair probably won't give you any problem with it. But if you really want to be totally correct, point of information is used when you're trying to ask a question about the substance of what's being decided or what's being talked about. The point of inquiry is when you need to ask the chair about a rules decision. So, or what, or what it is that you need to do, or what it is that you're supposed to do. It's a question about the parliamentary procedure itself. So you would say something like, point of information, Mr. Chairman, what's the wording of the resolution? But you could say, point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman, I want to make a motion to do such and such and such. What should I say to do that? Or, you know, point of, infor or point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman, um, it, it seemed like, you know, that person was out of order. Tell me why they weren't. That kind of thing. Okay? So, uh, I didn't put that in the slide deck, but you will find that on your cheat sheet. So, in conclusion, what did I do on Oh, good. Uh, so, in conclusion, <clears throat> these, these basics of parliamentary procedure really are the foundation of grassroots politics. They really are. We're a grassroots political organization. That's, that's I mean, all of our, um, all of our processes are built on assemblies and meetings and caucuses to make these decisions. That's how we nominate candidates, that's how we pass a platform, just go on down the line. So to know these things is really to be tapped into the ability to participate. Okay? Now, as an assembly, as a person in the assembly, you've got a lot of rights and you've got a lot of privileges and you've also got some responsibilities. You know, your your, one of your key responsibilities is, is to always be fair, respectful, um, you know, and, and, and generally present yourself with a sense of decorum. But it's also a responsibility for you to be paying attention and to make sure that, there, that, that a chairman isn't, you know, just through ignorance or, or, or just, just from, uh, you know, lack of consideration or carelessness, making mistakes and overriding the legitimate will of the body. Okay, so you, as the person in that assembly, are the check and balance on that chair. If something's going wrong, it's your duty to stand up and say, you know, point of order, or whatever. If you don't know what's going on, you will just simply be, be like a leaf in the wind of, of those within the assembly that know these rules. <coughs> You'll be looking around confused, you won't be sure how to vote, you'll just be kind of voting you know, based on the way your neighbor tells you to, or whatever. Once you know this stuff, and once you're tapped in, you're, you're, a, part, you're a part of the process. You know, you are, you're making these decisions. And personally, I find it to be fun and exciting. I think that when you when you go through this mock convention, you're going to see that this this actually this can be interesting. You know, it's almost like a chess game a little bit. You'll see people, you know, that are trying to get get their own personal business done, and then they're going to have supporters that are arguing their points, and then you're, there are going to be other people that are going to come up and are are going to try and use the process, you know, to 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 um, to influence what's going on. And so this back and forth can actually be really exciting if you know what's going on and if you can follow it and if you're staying tapped into it. So that's just my personal opinion, but in general, all knowledge is good. And we have a question. Would you cover a dilatory 
motion. Dilatory motion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not okay. Well, let me to refer to my cheat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the dilatory motion is. You got me. Well, it, there may be times when a person is making motions repetitively, and it's pretty clear that it's occupying time and not getting something substantive. So a chair can inform the body that he believes the motions are dilatory and that it's preventing other work from getting done. So if the person continually makes the same motion, I object, I object, or whatever, you could say, I think that's dilatory. Yeah, there's another way to deal with that. And we actually had this happen in our mock convention back in, uh, in Austin a few weeks ago. There's another way to deal with that, which is you can object, and this is an interrupt. This is an interrupting type motion. You can just stand up and interrupt the speaker and say that you object to consideration of the motion, which essentially means that you think the motion is silly. You just, you just think it's a silly concept that we're even talking about this. And if the body agrees, if the assembly agrees with you, then that motion is gone. So that's another way to get rid of it. Um, you can postpone it. You can also object to consideration of it if it's dilatory. Yes, sir. I've been the, the meetings and so forth for about 50 years. And the only place I've seen that made a real creaking, all of, most of these meetings were supposed to have been following Robert Trudeau's order. Mm -hmm. But the only ones that I can recall was when I was in high school in the Future Farmers Administration and with the Libertarian Select Committee. And do you have any suggestions of how to handle the uh, these like planning and zoning meetings or city commission meetings and so forth? You know, I, I think it's a great point. You know, I think that, uh, and, and like you, in, in my business, I attend meetings all the time where there's no pretense of any kind of following Robert's rules or parliamentary procedure. And I think that's a bad thing. I mean, I, I don't think that, I don't think that this kind of rigid structure is required all the time, especially in the case of, you know, informal meetings among small groups of people. A lot of times, you can get business done with, let's say, 10 or less people. And, and everybody's respectful, and everybody lets each other speak, and you just have informal votes, and it's all good. But I think that when you get to a certain point, um, this structure is, is the only way to, to really ensure that, 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 that you're getting good decisions, that you're having good decision-making processes. But to your point, everybody's got to agree to abide by those rules. And I mean, if most or all of the body has no idea what Robert's Rules is, or even what he's like I only put up about a half a dozen um, motions there that are enough to get business done. But if they don't even know what's on this cheat sheet, you're not going to have any success by just standing up and saying point of order. Everybody's going to look at you cross-eyed. You know? So I, I, I guess the only thing I can tell you is, or the only thing I could suggest is, start the process of teaching. You know, take this, take this information and start sharing it with the groups that you meet with and, and say, you know what? It seems to me that the last time we met, we had, we had an hour-long meeting, and 50 minutes of it was spent bickering. You know, what if we just try this? What if we just try this? And obviously, we're we're going to make mistakes, but I think that it would I think it would, it would serve us to help get business done. But that's the only thing I can suggest to you. I mean, I don't know what else to say besides that. So, oh, and I have one other thing that I wanted to share with you um, before I close up, and this is just a bit of fun. Um, somebody on the internet made this. It's called the uh, it's called the Bill of Rights for Roberts Rules, and it's a, a, a set of ten supplementary types of motions that I think you'll find humorous. And I think you also find I wanted to pass it out because it's also a great guide of what absolutely not to do in a meeting. And you will find you will go out into your conventions and your caucuses and your assemblies, and you will find people absolutely making these kind of motions. <laughs> and um, you can feel free to let them know that that is not the part of our Thank you.